People in the audience, you're welcome now to uh, raise your hand and we can try to take questions. I'll be passing this mic around, so maybe a little bit slow. Oh, going back first, go ahead. She did break a law. Uh, Timothy Christopher case in, uh, in Utah. I was crazy when I saw his lawyer said he committed civil disobedience. Don't forget him was guilty. Civil resistance means somebody else is committing a crime and you're speaking up. I think that's exactly what Bradley Bowman did. The other question I have was in regards to Nuremberg, can that be brought up on appeal? Th th this issue that he was doing what he had to do because he saw that uh, the violations of the Constitution. Before I pass it to uh, for an answer the, for the live stream, the two points were one, he pref uh, Max prefers the term civil resistance to disobedience because disobedience admits guilt and civil resistance does not. And the second question was, can Nuremberg principles be brought up uh, on the appeal? I think that uh, my expertise probably goes to the second point about the Nuremberg issues. You know, um, you're going to sort of put me on the spot about answering some questions about litigation strategy and tactics, right? But, um, and and I'm, not, I'm really going to avoid that, and I think it's in Chelsea's best interest to avoid that. But what I will say is that I think it does go to the core of the appropriate sentence for what um, Chelsea admitted to doing. And I think that um, in the military system, unlike in the federal system, there, there, aren't, um, there, isn't a, a fed, there aren't federal sentencing guidelines. As many of you probably know, in the federal sen system, if you are um, convicted of a crime, there's this whole uh, elaborate, hokey scheme of figuring out uh, how, how, what somebody should be sentenced to. And in the military system, that actually doesn't exist. And I should say, with respect to the federal system, there have been case law to say that the judge actually has discretion and whatnot, but, but the federal sentencing guidelines still matter. In the military system, the, the, uh, the, um, uh, whoever is doing the sentencing, whether that is the judge or in the military system it can be the jury, considers a host of um, sentencing factors that go to mitigation. And I think that one of the um, issues for Chelsea that goes directly to mitigation is her intent for what she did. And I don't see that as an aggravating factor. I actually view that as a mitigating factor. And I think that that's where those principles, the various principles about um, having a principled reason for why you act. And, and frankly, I think that there are also facts um, that, that I will certainly learn about that go to the command's failures with respect to Chelsea when she was in her role as an intelligence analyst. So, so I guess my initial impression for answering your, uh, your question is that I think that it's possibly an appropriate area to talk about w when you're looking at the appropriateness of the sentence that Chelsea had. Anyone want those? Are those, are those questions? Okay. Do you want to do those? Yes. Emma, can you handle well, I was, I was going Why don't you, you repeat the two questions? Who those are questions for? Well, whoever can answer them. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so the first question was whether the government can prevent Chelsea from from the the gender transition. Um, well, the government is trying to prevent her from obtaining. Um, treatment for gender dysphoria and they're doing that basically she's requested to receive comprehensive treatment for gender dysphoria which would probably involve speaking to a counselor who's qualified to to give specialized treatment in that area as well as receiving hormone therapy and thus far the prison has 
not responded to her request um, on those issues at all. At the beginning, right after the trial, a spokesperson for Fort Leavenworth specifically said that they would not provide those treatments. And as a result of that, Chelsea has been filing requests, and when she exhausts administrative remedies, she will likely take that to court and, and litigate to try to obtain those rights. There is precedent in federal court for prisoners to receive treatment for gender dysphoria, with the ruling saying that denying them that treatment is um, basically, it's mistreating them, it's a form of punishment. So we, we plan to support her in pursuing those. And the second question maybe would be better answered by Mr. Ward. Okay. Repeat the question. Uh, I think that the, the the second part of the question related to the role of WikiLeaks, the, 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 the whole issue with Julian Assange. So, you know, again, this is more of a procedural issue with respect to the difference between the trial and the appeal. But remember that on appeal, um, the judges will look at the appropriateness of the decision in light of the record that was already created. Um, so it's not it's not an area where you'll see the development of new facts, but really it will examine the appropriateness of the judge's decisions at trial based on that record. And so I don't know the, the extent to which those issues came up in the trial, frankly. If they didn't come up in the trial, then I don't see an avenue that it would come up on the appeal. I'll just mention one amusing thing about WikiLeaks in the trial, which we discovered early on. Uh, for some reason, the prosecutors weren't answering the judge's orders or the defense's motions, and we didn't, no one could figure out why. And then we realized that the motions, the uh, motions and the, the, the filings by the defense and the judge contained the word WikiLeaks, and that was something that was not allowed for them to have an emails about. So that was being sent to their spam folders, and they weren't able to see it. So uh, I don't know that will affect the appeal, but it was kind of an amusing moment that they had to deal with in front here. That's, that's essentially correct. Um, she has filed in... Repeat what he says so <coughs> people understand. Oh, yes. So he, um, Jim there was asking about um, whether Chelsea had received any, any treatment in prison um, and wish to clarify that we're not even to the point of talking about sexual reassignment surgery, but we're just talking about treatment for gender dysphoria. Um, which is, is broader in scope. Um, and that's, that's correct. Chelsea um, has been diagnosed in the past talking to, to military psychiatrists. She has been diagnosed multiple times with gender dysphoria. And she wishes now, while she is at Fort Leavenworth, to speak to somebody who's specialized in gender therapy to help decide what steps she wants to take um, she's fairly certain she does want to try hormone therapy, but as far as um, surgery or anything like that, um, she, she first just wants the ability to receive counseling. Um, I guess I'll, gener I'll add that generally speaking, um, you know, I think Chelsea considers that to be a bit of a personal issue, so she might not go into too much detail publicly as to what steps she would like to take. Um, but she has filed to change her name in federal court. Um, so the military can object to that, but they can't, they don't make the decision ultimately. Um, but beyond the name change, everything is up to Leavenworth and so far they haven't, um, they haven't moved to help her yet. So we're going to be pressuring them in that regard. 
with how private Manning conducted private Manning in court, and how Chelsea Manning has conducted Chelsea Manning's presentation itself, we should not be defining. We should be listening to what Chelsea is saying to us through you and through the attorneys. My question to the attorney is, is this not a continuation of cruelty and, and persecution beyond the norm when a person has a medical condition that the military has already defined and diagnosed and is not allowing the military person to be treated medically? Is there any basis let me just re uh, make, repeat that, and I think it's a really good point to remind everybody how Chelsea behaved in court and how she is dealing with this issue uh, in the public now. I think those are really important issues, and I hope that we do listen more than just make assumptions and uh, and speak about it as if it's you know, our business. It's actually her business. And this, the question was whether or not this is a continuation, the lack of treatment for uh, this, this issue is a continuation of cruel and unusual punishment uh, by the prison authorities. Can we patch Nancy in by Skype for some of these? <laughs> um, let me first say that Mr. Coombs has agreed to assist Chelsea with these issues, okay? And so I feel like I may be infringing on, on his turf um, by talking about this. Generally, what I would say is that obviously a prisoner has a right to um, a safe environment and, and, and one that's healthy for them. What, what I, I don't know, to be honest with you, whether this issue would be something that would relate um, to, the, to what are essentially Eighth Amendment questions. So I don't know. Um, I'm not going to speculate. I think that what you're saying makes a lot of sense, but I think that that's probably a question that's appropriately addressed to Mr. Coombs. I'd like to ask you the, oh, we have to, we no, the, the same question would go to the two whistleblowers. And a lot of the people have questions that were really good. Well, Do you want to give quick responses to those, anyone? No, no, the question to the whistleblower is, in, in your experience, at what point did the government cross the line of, <laughs> in terms of the way they treated you? And is there anything that Uh, so, I mean, I think the government crosses the line when it breaks the law, and uh, in my case, they immediately uh, falsified internal government records, and that was pretty much crossing the line. Um, and you know, I, I mean, I think for most whistleblowers, the, the most frustrating thing is, you know, you're risking your career and perhaps more to try to raise concerns about a serious issue within government, but everything then turns on an examination of you and your motives rather than the issue that you're trying to raise attention to. So, yeah. I really, I just, I just ditto uh, what Mike said, so. The question was whether or not the uh, convening authority has any time limit and whether or not they could be delaying to kind of slow roll and lengthen the appeal process and slow the appeal down. Good question. Man, you guys are a good, uh, good group. Um, like I think I said before, I, I don't believe that there is a time frame to act. My experience, although Frankly, this is something that it, you know I would I would probably look a little bit closer at if I didn't feel as though I had this sort of line with respect to handling the appeal once that process has already taken place. But my my, my personal experience was that the uh, there was always a sense of trying to get the 
the the convening authority to take action reasonably quickly. Um, obviously, if they if they acted quickly and and reversed the judge's decision, that would be fantastic. Um, in terms of harm, I guess what I would say is, you know, the first the the first aspect of that is our work as the appellate council is starting. Um, not only through doing things like this, but through preparing ourselves for the appeal. And, you know, by reading the cases, re familiarizing ourselves with the record, um, I think that if there was a sense that the convening authority that was doing something improper at that stage, that would fall within Mr. Coombs's role as the trial counsel for the, for the case, but I'm, I'm certain that there would be discussions about what to do. So it's, it's not a satisfactory answer for you, but I guess my impression is that it, um, out of the larger scheme of issues that I'm worried about in the case, that's probably not one of them. The question was whether or not the uh, torture of Bradley Manning uh, sh is enough to dis have the case reversed and maybe it should have been dismissed and makes the comparison to Ellsberg whose case was dismissed after a series of unethical actions by the Nixon administration against Ellsberg and the judge dismissed it after a four month trial just so it was about to go to the jury and uh, said dismissed for prosecutorial abuse. Um, yes, sort of. <laughs> in the military system, there's this concept of un unlawful pretrial punishment. And um, Chelsea is entitled to uh, credit um, for unlawful pretrial confinement. And I think one of the issues in the case is that she, um, that there were lots of facts that were presented regarding her conditions and the way she was treated. And I think that Nancy made very, some pa very powerful statements about that. Uh, you know, my understanding is that she was kept in solitary confinement, that she was made to stand for long periods of time, that she was made to stand naked and treated far different than you would expect any, any prisoner to be treated in that, under those circumstances. And I think that one of the core issues in the appeal and one of the criticisms in the case is that the judge um, did not look at that issue appropriately and, 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 and uh, that, that, that Chelsea should have um, been treated fairer in that process. So I think there is a mechanism and it certainly will be one of the core issues in the appeal that we'll be dealing with. Uh, so my question is about the changing role of the Chelsea Manning Support Network. In the past three years, uh, on the advice of Coombs, uh, Manning did not speak to the public, did not communicate with the public. And now that um, Chelsea Manning has you know, phone access, has sl more increased communication with the public, curious uh, how her role changes with the network. It's been changed. Well, during the trial, up, up and the okay, <laughs> the question was, how does the role of the support network change now that Chelsea Manning is communicating a little bit more with the public, and how does her role change as well? For a little explanation for people, up to the trial and through the trial, there was a real fear that if Chelsea Manning was communicating with the public or with activists, that that would be used against her by the prosecution. And for that reason, although we were spending a lot of time advocating on her behalf, we were mostly communicating with her legal team and her family in order to do our work. After the trial, 
Well, and let me just first say that sitting in the trial, I'm now convinced that that would have been the case, that they would have tried to use that against her because I saw them do that on, um, on other grounds, like with David Haas. But after the trial, there was less of a concern of that being the case because her appeals were going to be on the basis of what happened during the trial. So she has taken a somewhat more active role um, just in giving feedback on our work and communicating um, some of her, it, well, some of her interests, some of her messaging. We actually worked with her recently on an on a portrait, um, which is not yet finished. We just have the sketch, um, but that shows her as she sees herself as a trans woman, and we're going to be integrating that into our graphics. Mm -hmm. it, was on the table out there. it was on the table out there, yeah. And she's also interested in making some of her thoughts public, thoughts about freedom of information and government transparency and restrictions on press access and all of these other big issues that um, she's actually thought a lot about. And since I've been speaking to her, I've actually learned that she has read and researched a tremendous amount about some of these issues, even starting before her arrest. And she can quote court rulings from memory. Um, her interest in these issues actually runs very deep. So I think that we'll, we'll see in the coming months how things go, um, but I think that she may have some ideas that will be interesting to the public and that will maybe spark interest in her case. Well, to answer the first question, there has been no direct communication between Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning. That would have been news tonight if that. <laughs> 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 I could see the reporters already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, there has not been. Um, well, the question was whether or not Ed Snowden and, and, and Chelsea Manning had contact. And, and the second question was whether Snowden was influenced by Chelsea Manning. Right. Oh, to make his leaks public and through the various news sources. Rather than anonymously like Chelsea did it. Right. Well, I, I think Edward Snowden would have to answer that question. I think, I think based on his public statements that he was aware of Chelsea Manning, I think it's, it's quite possible he had this case in mind and that influenced certain aspects of how he conducted himself. He said one reason he fled the country was because he feared being treated in prison the way that Chelsea was and receiving that same kind of harsh prosecution. So it definitely had an influence there. <laughs> yeah.
love to know how like our movements, how people envision our movements can work together and support each other, and and um, you know how uh, you know as someone from the LGBT movement, how we can support uh, the work of the Chelsea Men. The question was. Um, I think it was two parts. So first of all, it was how does being transgender affect the way that Chelsea's treated in prison? But the other question was how can the LGBT movement, um, LGBT rights activists help support the Chelsea Manning Support Network and how can we work together? Is that correct? Yeah. Um, we'll try all right. Kaylee Whalen. Yep. I, I think your name is familiar <laughs> to me. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that. Um, so first of all, Chelsea does report that she has not been harassed in prison, thankfully. We're, we're very happy to hear that. Um, at least not to her face, which is, is an issue as well. Um, she actually said that since the news broke that she's filed for a name change, that some of the other prisoners and guardsmen have asked if they can call her Chelsea. So there's, there's some showing of support there even. Um, but that being said, she does feel very isolated. Uh, she feels like there's nobody she can talk to at the prison about her gender um, dysphoria who's going to really understand. Um, so it's not something she communicates much with um, while she's at prison. And that's one reason that having people in the outside world who can show support to her and write to her is very important and has really helped um, keep her motivated. Um, for the second question, there was actually some news on Friday, and maybe you've seen it, but the San Francisco um, Pride Committee, LGBT Pride Celebration Committee, decided to make Chelsea Manning an honorary Grand Marshal this year, which means that she'll, <laughs> yeah. So SF Pride is a huge event. It attracts almost two million people every year. It's, it's a huge, huge event. People come from all over the world. And being a Grand Marshal means that she will be one of the public faces of the parade. Um, so that's a really meaningful showing of support from one corner of the LGBT community. And we're very happy about that. Um, I think generally, the more demonstrations of public support we can have for Chelsea, the better, insofar as the White House and General Major General Buchanan still have major decision-making power they could reduce her sentence at any point if they decide to do so. And I think to some extent, maybe public pressure could influence the prison um, to decide to provide her with treatment if they decide not doing so would be, would just cause more trouble for them publicly. So I would absolutely encourage groups to continue to do demonstrations of support and actually organizing contingents at other pride parades around the country is one thing that I would definitely encourage LGBT groups to do. Anyone else want to comment on that? No. She made a choice to disclose extraordinary truths in the public interest, and now she's making a choice for who she is and her own, her own well-being. The last time I checked, we all have in alien rights extraordinary phrase from the Declaration of Independence. That extends to Chelsea's right of choice and who sh she wants to be. I just want to say that public support does make a difference, folks. Not just to the uh, elected officials and prison authorities, and I have no question the spotlight on Chelsea's helping make sure she's not being mistreated in prison, but it'll make a difference to the courts too. Public opinion affects courts as much as they pretend it doesn't, it does, so really urge people to get organized and mobilized again. We have to keep this pressure up for Chelsea. Yes. No, not you, the woman here.
person inside the government and inside the military so that we could perhaps work with them if we know anyone who is supporting us? That's a tough question. The question is whether anybody in the government, uh, in the military, or other areas is supporting Chelsea. Good question. These are good questions, guys. That's, that's a tough question. I'll give you that. Um, as far as, we know lots of people who've left the government who support Chelsea Manning. <laughs> Both people who are here and people who aren't tonight. Um, I don't know of anyone inside the military who openly supports Chelsea Manning. I do know of active duty soldiers who do support her and email her and even send us photos of themselves, but they are not public because they could be punished for that. I do know that there are some Congress people who support Chelsea Manning. Um, Ron Paul and Rand Paul libertarians have made public comments of support. Dennis Kucinich did as well, although he's now no longer in Congress. Um, and I'm sure there's a few other Congress people whose names I forgot who are less well known on the national scene. Um, but it's I'm not aware of Jimmy Carter saying anything publicly about Chelsea Manning. But I think if anybody has a way to get in contact with Jimmy Carter, or other <laughs> politicians for that matter, it would absolutely be good to have more people voice their support publicly. We're running out of time. Hey, hey, how many more questions do we have here? You've asked one before. Oh, boy. Can we try to do this? Let's go through four quick questions, then we'll get answers from the audience. Go ahead, you go with your question. Uh, what is Chelsea's birthday? When is Chelsea's birthday? God, I can't remember. I think it's December 17th. Okay, next one. Yes, uh, just very quickly, I'd just like to make a, a statement and uh, a question. I'd like to thank you profusely from the bottom of my heart for having this session. I have learned more about Chelsea tonight than anything I have read or seen in the press. Um, secondly, I'd just like to mention that uh, I've been part in a secret program run by the Defense Department against activists in which they are being used in human experiments. And mm -hmm. the one that's currently on, in which I'm involved without my permission, is uh, to induce um, lack of sleep to produce dementia and anxiety. My question to you is this. Have you thought about having a month, a Chelsea Manning month, uh, which I think would be used to get funds He thanks us for this session and also wants to uh, let us know there are other programs targeting activists and that uh, asks whether or not we are planning any thought about a month for Chelsea. We've, done def we've definitely done national days of actions and multiple events along those lines. I don't think we've ever done a month-long event, though. Um, well, I, th I feel like Kevin just covered it. No, oh, we, haven't. <laughs> we haven't done a month-long event. <laughs> Um, but we're trying to think of more ways we can be creative moving forward, so we can certainly, we will certainly take that under consideration. Okay, down the last couple of questions. Yes? Um, yeah, go ahead, and then I'll get you next. Um, I was wondering if, uh, are there other espionage cases that you use to show that 35 years is excessive, so in comparison? The question is whether or not other espionage cases show 35 years is excessive. <clears throat> I think that uh, you know, as we do our preparations, we'll we'll do we'll we'll do surveys of other sentences. What I can tell you now is I couldn't rattle off particular cases, but but prosecutions under the Espionage Act are fairly few and be far be, uh, between, and this seems to be far in excess of any of those other cases.
now after the fact, you know, as time has gone by, we're like, well, all these cool things are done to her. You know, it, it almost defeats the case they're trying to make against her in doing those things. So, so why would they? Why would they do those things? Because they can. Well, the, the question was, why are they uh, doing a self-defeating act like uh, abusing Chelsea when they're trying to prosecute her and those things work against the prosecution? And the answer in the front was, be, from a veteran, because they can. <laughs> Does anyone else want to try to answer that? Or? I was just going to say he has a cool haircut. He so. <laughs> says cool haircut. All right, two more questions. Yes, in the red shirt. It's called WikiLeaks. <laughs> the question was, is there is an ongoing campaign to encourage whistleblowing? Uh, there is. There are a number of groups that work here in D.C. Uh, Government Accountability Project, Project on Government Oversight, the ACLU. Uh, the, what's that? Anonymous. <laughs> Anonymous. I don't know if you have any more. I've simply called for maximum exposure and disclosure of all government crimes, wrongdoing, illegality, violations of the Constitution and just simply crimes against humanity. I mean, it's just, I'd always hoped that um, in my own particular case, in the circumstance which I find myself, uh, that others would come forward. Um, Snowden came forward with, you know, extraordinary amount of documentation uh, to essentially validate much of what I already said uh, within the system. Um, we're, we're faced with a distinct prospect, you know, of a government that just simply wants to keep information away from the public, and it's really simple. The reason they want to is because they don't want to. They don't want the public to know about what they're doing, and what they're doing is using national security as the great excuse to justify, um, as I've said, unchaining themselves from the rule of law, the Constitution and all, all bounds or constraints in terms of due process. It's that simple. And it is a catch-22. It is, is true. We have the power. Who's going to stop us now? And that requires, it doesn't take a whole lot of people. You have to remember, in the American Revolution, only about 3% of the population actively participated. And they were the traitors of the day, <laughs> even the terrorists of the day. Add to that for a second. You know, it's not just in the security field that we have a need for whistleblowers, by the way. Every agency of government, not just the Obama administration, but previous ones, there's deep corruption. And many people in government went to those agencies because they care about the environment, because they care about communications, whatever issue they care about. And they went because they really wanted to do good work there, and they got there, and now they found it's corrupt. And so we used to do, during Occupy, we used to do what we called Whistleblower Wednesdays. We'd uh, pick different agencies and go to the agency and hand out material about how you can blow the whistle safely. Uh, uh, you know, as people came out for lunch, because we really think that whistleblowing is really important. Uh, we want this government is way off track, and um, the, the first the first step of correcting the mistakes of the government is the truth, and uh, we're not getting a lot of that. And so, really, we want to encourage whistleblowers, and uh, thankfully for groups like WikiLeaks, and there'll be copy WikiLeaks copies that will come out that will make it easier whistleblowers are to anonymously leak important information that we need to know. We just hope the media will cover it correctly. Last question. Uh, question to the lawyer and to, and to the uh, gentleman. <coughs> How does your research and your analysis of the I've seen people trying to take one, one issue and make it the issue rather than putting them both together. So I'd like to have your, how you would like us not to make it just a crime women's issue, not to make it just a, a, a military appeal issue, but how do we bring them together in a way that informs each side of that question? Repeat the question. The question was, how do we 
When it comes to the two major issues that people are aware of in Chelsea's case publicly right now, there's freedom of information, government transparency, overclassification, whistleblowing, and then there's gender dysphoria and her fight to get appropriate treatment for that. And as supporters, how do we deal with both of those issues? Do we prioritize one? Do we integrate them, et cetera? And I think, obviously, this is a, a complicated thing people have been thinking about. I guess the perspective I would like to provide is coming from Chelsea herself. And that is that she is not one thing. She's a person. And these are both issues that affect her and that part of supporting somebody, who something blah. Part of supporting someone who did something very brave for their country and has gotten many years in prison as a result of that involves supporting them as a person unless people who are brave and step forward and take risks know that they can rely on receiving that kind of personal support, then we won't have whistleblowers. We won't have people willing to take those risks. As far as trying to tie those issues together, when Chelsea wrote her letter to President Obama, she mentioned being concerned about various kinds of oppression. Part of her motivation, I believe, for releasing documents about wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were her concerns that the lives of people in Iraq and Afghanistan were being undervalued. Um, whether that's an issue of race or religion or just a first world country doing what it can in a third world country, that's an issue of oppression and oppressing somebody because of their sexuality or their gender is another form of oppression. So if we as a society want to move toward a more equitable system um, where people aren't mistreated, tortured, or even killed for being who they are, um, then I think it makes sense to embrace both of these issues. Really nicely said. Any comment? No? Yes? You know, first off, I want to say that my, my law firm participated in the case to provide uh, back pay to service members that had been discharged under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Um, so I think the, that obviously was um, significant for those, those service members. Uh, to answer the question, I think that it's an issue that goes to command failure. And again, I think it, it factors into the mitigation for the case against Chelsea. Um, I think that y the military always gives a lot of lip service to helping and supporting service members um, who are under great pressures, you know, oftentimes. And they're, they, um, you know, Chelsea is very bright, very capable. People are also very young when they're in the military. And, um, you know, I think that part of the military structure is supposed to be helping to identify and help people um, so that they feel comfortable, obviously, when they see wrongdoing and we know where that, where that leads. Um, but also, if you're dealing with family, emotional, personal issues, I think that those are all factors that um, relate to the command failure and show the harshness of the punishment. And I will tell you that that will certainly be front and center in, in our appeal. I'll just say the information wants to be free. And so just take a moment and imagine a Chelsea not making the information available to us, making us know what the truth is about critical knowledge and information about our government. Just imagine if Chelsea had never made the information free to who we are out in the public. There's a whole lot we wouldn't have known still to this day. And that was an extraordinarily courageous choice that Chelsea made uh, for all of us. Great final point. Um, I just want to say that Chelsea has shown a lot of courage both in the leaks that she made and in talking about her own uh, sexual identification issues. And I think that she really deserves our support, folks. 
I hope that people will get serious about educating your friends and neighbors about her, uh, talking about this case where you can, and organizing people to mobilize to support Chelsea through this long process. So thank you all very much for coming. We appreciate your support. Visit the Chelsea Manning Support Network and get involved.